Hey, good morning. My name is Barnabas, and it is great to be here this morning. You'll find the story for today in Acts chapter 12 and 13. And I want to see if some of my younger people are right close by. Do I have an Anna, maybe? I do, yes. And Mariana, good morning to you. Let me see if there's a William that looks like Charlie and Leo. Hey, you guys. Okay, if you can hear me, that's you can stay there. If you want to come closer, you can come closer too. It's up because I'm right here next to Mariana and Anna. If you want to come up closer, sure, come on up if you want to, and I'll see if William comes in also. So my name is Barnabas, and here's what's going on. I'm gonna just like Miss Linda prayed about a story. We have a short story this morning about. Barnabas, come on up. And what happened? And so, Barnabas and my friend Paul. I'm Barnabas. Good to see you. Hi, Grace. We were praying together in church. And as we prayed, the Holy Spirit came and was with all of us and started talking to our hearts. And the people of the church said, Hi, sisters. Yeah. Said, I want you to send Barnabas, me, and Paul to go as missionaries to tell people about Jesus. And so that's exactly what we did. We prayed together. They laid their hands on us, and they said, Father, go before Barnabas and Paul as they go and tell other people about Jesus. And so we left. It was like within a day or two, we packed up, we went to a boat, and we sailed across to an island, and we told the people from one end of the island to the other about Jesus. It was awesome. Many people believed the story about what Jesus had done and who he is and how he's forgiven us. Well, then we left that tip of the island and we sailed across. And when you hear Pastor this morning, he's going to talk about two different cities. Well, they've got the same name. It's like in Minnesota, we have a Minneapolis. But if you go to Kansas and you talk about Minneapolis, they get all excited because they think you're talking about Minneapolis, Kansas. Well, who, I mean, that's a great city, I'm sure. But we, we like Minneapolis, Minnesota, right? That's where we live. So there were two Antiochs. There was an Antioch in Syria, and that's where Christ, we who follow Jesus were first called Christians. And then there was an Antioch of Pisidia. So we went to Antioch of Pisidia on our missionary journey. And we went to church on a Sunday morning just like this. We were sitting there. Paul was next to me. And we were sitting in the congregation, and the people had read the word of the Lord. And then they sat down, and they sent someone from the pulpit down the aisle to the end, and they whispered to Paul and me. They said, hey, do you have anything you want to come up and preach about? Well, when Paul got a chance to preach, he was like, oh, yeah. And so he... Uh, stood up, I sat back there praying for him, and he went right up to the front, and he said, brothers and sisters, and then he started telling a story, and that's what pastor's gonna do today. He told the story of the people of Israel and how they had been in Egypt for 400 years, how they'd left, how God brought them out of Egypt, and they crossed what did they do? They, wasn't there a big, like a big sea that they went, that God opened up? Yeah, right. He crossed the Red Sea. God did it. That's exactly right. And they were in the desert. And he brought them into the promised land. So Paul told them this story. But then here's the exciting part. And this is what Miss Linda prayed about this morning. At near the end. Near the end when Paul was talking, he said this. Mighty Buddha. I know. Yeah. <laughs> he said two things. He said, I want you to know that through Jesus, 
the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And then he went on and he said, through him, that's through Jesus, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. And that's the story that Miss Linda prayed about. And that's the story of us here today. When we ask Jesus to come into our hearts, when we believe in him, he forgives us and sets us free from every sin. So pastor's going to be preaching about that today, and we're going to have a chance to listen and draw some pictures in our coloring books and take some notes about what Jesus has done in our hearts. And that's what your moms and dads are here listening for, and your uncles and aunts and your grandpas and grandmas. And that's what we get to learn about today, what Jesus has done in our hearts in forgiving us. Okay, that's our story from the Bible, from Acts chapter 12, the end of 12 and 13. And now we can wander back towards our moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas. And pastor's going to come and preach it. Today's scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 13, verses 13 through 52. It's in your pew Bibles, page 755. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed, and sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath day, they entered, a syna entered the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law and the prophets, the leader of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of, of exhortation for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness, and he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king, God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? Am I not the one you are looking for? But there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are, ready, that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they have carried out all that was written about him, they took down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will, will never be subject to decay, as God, as God has said. I will give you the holy and sure blessing promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now, when David has served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. 
Therefore, my friends, I want, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care of what the prophets have said. Does not, take care of what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am, doing, for I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe even if someone told you. As Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue the grace of God, continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Bartimaeus answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you rejected and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust from their feet as a warning to them and went on to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Good morning. Great to see you all today. It seems like it's been a long time since I've preached. I'm a little, little out of practice, I think, but uh, we've been in, uh, in very capable hands over the last few weeks, but, uh, but I get to do it here uh, at least once in a row, and then, uh, and then I'll start up again sometime after, after summer. Um, you may have noticed, first of all, that Pastor Abby and Andrew are not here today, um, and you didn't. Some of you are like gasping, what, they're not here. Um, they are not here today. They are actually at the hospital, and so you can pray for them. Uh, for those of you who are not regulars and don't know who Pastor Abby is, she's about nine months pregnant. So <laughs> anyway, so pray for them uh, even as we're here. Uh, uh, anyway, all right, so one thing before we get into the sermon, uh, I want to report on another of the uh, pulse surveys that we've been doing. Many of you know that oftentimes we will do a survey really every couple of months, just very quick three-question surveys, trying to get uh, our finger on the pulse of the congregation and what you think about various things that we are teaching and doing. And, uh, and a few weeks ago, or actually a couple of months ago, we did one on how we respond to God. And, and a couple of... and. So that was like four months ago, and then a couple months ago we did one. We asked about ministries of mercy, Uh, and we've talked a lot about ministries of mercy as we've gone through the book of Luke and Acts. They're a a huge focus of uh, of both of those, and uh, you've seen just how important ministries of mercy are, and so we wanted to see how we as a church think about those ministries, but even more importantly, how we are actually living out those ministries, because it doesn't really matter how much you know you should be doing if you're not actually doing it. It doesn't really do you any good. And so we asked about uh, a number of different sort of areas or kinds of ministries of mercy from immigration to disability ministry, families in crisis, racial reconciliation, social isolation, poverty, prison ministry, trafficking, and slave labor, and just wanted to see kind of where your passions lie. And, And according to your interests or passions, you listed... Uh, these three were your top three, social isolation, families in crisis, and disabilities. And of course, again, we know what we ought to do, and so we also wanted to know what are you actually doing with your passions and gifts and, and all of that. And so we followed it up by asking, in the last year, which of these areas have you been involved in? And by far, 
working with families in crisis was the most common one. Uh, and this makes sense. Uh, number one, because of our involvement with Together for Good, and uh, that gives us a great opportunity to be able to do that, whether it's uh, you know, taking care of kids, uh, giving rides, helping moms, uh, even uh, giving financial support to it. But it's also an area where it's very easy to give practical support to people that you know. You don't even have to work through an organization to deal with and to minister to families in crisis. And so many of you do it just by nature. You see a need and you fulfill that need, which is an amazing thing. That should be the character of all believers. Uh, But one of the things that stood out from all of the responses really had to do with this thing that we call social isolation. And I don't know if you've noticed, you've heard people talk about the fact that it seems to be kind of endemic in our society. Uh, People are lonely, especially after two years of COVID and, and, you know, Things are kind of getting back to normal, but there are still a lot of people who are experiencing a great deal of isolation. Add on to that, we live in a culture that tends to isolate people anyway. And, uh, and so people get used to that and people are very lonely. But one of the great things about the church is, is I think it is actually the perfect solution to social isolation because God gave us not just individual believers, but he gave us a community of people that's supposed to uh, act like a family, like a healthy family, not the way you know a lot of families do today, uh, but it's supposed to be this healthy family that's made up of people from all kinds of different families. And, uh, and, and the trouble is, is that even many churches don't operate this way. Uh, but uh, one of the good things is, is I think in many ways we do. And I agree that this is a huge need both outside the church, but also inside the church. And, uh, and this is one where we can organize, certainly. We can make programs and, you know, uh, you know uh, sort of centralize it from the office and things like that. But this is also an area where we as individual members of this church can just build the character of making sure that we're taking care of each other. To make sure that you're noticing when people are not around, okay? Uh, if, we, if we can't do that with our own people, then we're not going to be able to invite other people into to experience family. And so, well, you know, one of the things I want to do is, especially because so many of you said this is a passion for you, uh, I want to make sure that this is something that we're doing as a community. That you're keeping your eye out for people, not just the people who are here, although you can talk to them too, talk to each other, certainly, But also for people who are not, if you haven't seen them in a few weeks, reach out to them, make a call, send a text, get together for coffee, and just make sure that we're taking care of each other, and then let's make sure that we extend it out to our neighbors around us. I actually made a a video about this a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we put a link in the weekly, and we'll actually put that link in the weekly again this week because it gives some tips for how to do that. And I would love to make sure, especially as we're coming to the end of summer and people are now back in town, not at the cabin so often and that, uh, we'll start start to see more people showing up. But, you know, Keep your eye out. If there are some people who you haven't seen much this summer and then we get into September and you still haven't seen them, reach out to them. See how they're doing. Because that's one of the great advantages that we have, both as a small church, but just as the church in general, that we care for one another. Okay, So make sure that you're being intentional about that and uh, I'm confident that we can be the, uh, the church and the people that God created us to be. Okay, let's get into the message. Acts chapter 13. From the time I received my very first Bible, the Bible of my own, I was probably, I don't know, 10 years old. It was a, it was a New King James Bible, and I was so excited because it wasn't the stodgy old King James. It was the, it was the New King James, right? And uh, uh, there was one thing about that Bible that I was really excited about, the maps, right? Now, I know that the maps are not part of the original manuscripts, right? Like Luke, when he wrote the book of Acts, did not hire a cartographer or anything like that. But I still love the maps. And the reason is, is because in full color, you can see the world of the Bible. It helps us to be able to visualize the world of Paul. And and the ones that I really loved were the maps about Paul's missionary journeys. And I would follow them through just as Mark was talking about the first leg of this, uh, I mean Barnabas, sorry. As Barnabas was talking about the first leg of, uh, of Paul's missionary journey, I could just see it in my head because I was looking at those maps and he's, you know, going across to the island 
mainland, and then he goes back up to the mainland, and, and uh, it's just really cool. It helps you to be able to, to see what's going on. Well, the cool thing uh, about what we're doing today is, is we've finally gotten to the map, right? Uh, we've gotten to Paul's missionary journeys. In fact, today is really the first that we see of Paul's missionary journeys. And, uh, and it begins in chapter 13, and it begins by telling us that the church in Antioch, which was very quickly becoming the center of Christianity, it was moving from Jerusalem up to Antioch, it was becoming the center of Christianity or the Christian mission, it sent out Barnabas and Paul to share the gospel all around the Roman Empire. Now, there are two interesting things that happen in this chapter that maybe don't really have a whole lot to do with the story, but if you want to win Bible trivia, they're kind of interesting things. Uh, The first one is this, is that up until this point in the book of Acts, uh, Saul is referred to as Saul. Okay, that's his, that's his Hebrew name. But uh, then in verse 9, we see this. Luke writes this. Then Saul, and then parenthetically, he writes, who was also called Paul, all right? Seems kind of insignificant, but it's at this moment that Luke stops calling him Saul, and now from that point on, he's known as Paul. His name is, is changed. And, you know, Paul is actually sort of the Greek version or Greek Uh, name uh, because he was going out to the Gentiles he thought maybe it would be better if he had a if he had a Greek name all right but there's actually another interesting thing in this chapter uh, because when Paul first became a Christian if you remember all of the other Christians were scared of him they were afraid of him Uh, they were kind of skeptical about whether he actually became a Christian because he was a persecutor of the church he was notorious for that but who was it that brought Paul under his wings, who brought him into the church, who advocated to the church for Paul. Who was it? It's Barnabas, right? And he took him under his wings and he started to mentor him. He raised him up in the faith and that's why, you know, we call Barnabas the encourager and he certainly was that. And so it shouldn't be too much of a shock when the church chooses Barnabas and Paul to work together to go on the first Christian mission. And, and, and actually at first, Luke refers to them in that order, Barnabas and and you know, early on, Barnabas and Saul. But when we get to verse 9, not only does Saul's name change to Paul, but from that point on, uh, Luke also switches the order of their names and starts calling them Paul and Barnabas, right? And so what you're seeing here is you're starting to see a little shift happen. In fact, at the very first, in, in verse 13, where we start this passage today, look at, look at what he says. Um, he says, uh, from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia. Doesn't even mention Barnabas at that point. And so what you see is you start to see this switch that's happening where Paul is becoming the guy, right? These are now Paul's missionary journeys, even though it was Barnabas that mentored him. All right, so there you go. If you want to win some Bible trivia, uh, you, can, you can let people know that this is where it is. Well, in our story today, Uh, They came to the city of Pisidian Antioch, and like Mark said, there's a reason why it's called Pisidian Antioch. It's because there was another Antioch. It's like uh, the example that I came up with was distinguishing between Rochester, Minnesota, and Rochester, New York. It's kind of that sort of thing. It's Antioch, but it's in, uh, actually in Galatia, in the region of Galatia. So if you ever read the book of Galatians, these are the people that that, uh, Paul is writing to. Anyway, When he gets to Antioch, Paul starts a pattern that he would follow throughout all of his missionary journeys. The first thing he would do is he would go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Now, of course, this wouldn't have been unusual for Paul. He uh, was Jewish, and he had been in a synagogue probably somewhere between 99 and 100% of the Sabbaths in his life up to that point. And uh, so he knew the Jewish story, and, uh, and so that's always where he began his evangelism, even when he said, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. He still went to the synagogue, synagogue very, the very first thing. But it was actually something that was more than just pragmatic. Uh, actually, he went there because he believed that the Jewish people had been pre-evangelized, right? Now, to understand what I mean by that, you have to understand what I mean by when I use the word the gospel, or what the Bible uses, uh, what the Bible means when it talks about the gospel. Now, the Greek word that is used in the New Testament for gospel is the word euangelion, okay? You can tell that we get the word evangelism from that, Uh, but it literally means the good news. So when you evangelize, 
you share the good news. The question is, what is the good news? Well, for the last 50 years or so, the evangelical church have answered this question in in certain ways, and it's usually made in some kind of, bye-bye, Marmar, see ya. Uh, it's usually in, uh, in some kind of a formula like uh, the four spiritual laws or the Romans road or the bridge illustration. You've probably seen those or used those, been, been trained to do that. And, and they all talk about pr- uh, eternal life. Uh, it's a way that you can avoid hell or you can spend eternity with God in heaven and, and praise God for that. That is good news. And I, I believe it. I fully believe that. Okay? But according to the New Testament, that's not the gospel. Now, it's part of the gospel, it's an implication of the gospel, but it's not actually the gospel. And we can see this pretty easily by looking at the evangelistic sermons in the book of Acts and and looking at them and saying, well, what is it that the apostles did? Because it would be kind of silly to go and look at all the apostles' evangelistic sermons and, well, I I don't see the four spiritual laws or the Romans road or anything like that. Well, what is it that they actually did preach? What is the gospel that they preached. Well, let's take a minute and and walk through some of them, okay? The first one uh, we see in Acts chapter 2, where where Peter preaches after he receives the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He stands up in front of Jews from all over the place, and what does he say? Well, he walks them through Israel's story, and he shows them all of the ways that God had been with Israel. He showed up on their behalf, and all of the ways that Israel's story led them to Jesus. In fact, he takes them all the way back to King David, and uh, who the Jews considered to be the greatest king. But then he says, well, David died, and you know what? He's still dead. And, uh, and so, you know, the Psalms and the prophets talk about a kingdom that will be established forever, and a king that will be, you know, that will reign forever, and well, David is dead, and he's still dead, and so David can't be that one. Even though we think he's the greatest king, he can't be the one. And so then he leads them to Jesus and he says, well, this Jesus was the one who claimed to be that eternal king, but when he died, of course, then his disciples thought, well, yeah, I guess he was just like David. In fact, he wasn't really even a king, but he died and he was dead. But then what happened? Well, here's what, here's what Peter says, but this Jesus God raised up of which we are all witnesses. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus proved that he is the eternal king. Right? Now, in the end, here's the gospel call that he makes in, in uh, uh, Acts 2, 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord and Messiah. Okay? He's both King of Israel and Lord of all of humanity, both Jews and Gentiles. Okay? It's kind of hidden in there, but you can see that. He's King and he's Lord. Now, At first, this doesn't seem like such great news for the people of Jerusalem, right? Because what did he say? You killed the king, right? And kings don't take very kindly to that, or administrations don't take very kindly to that. Okay, but the good news for them is that if they repented, then Jesus, who is the eternal king, is kind and forgiving and full of grace, that he would forgive them and would empower them with the Holy Spirit to live in his kingdom, okay? All right, that's the first gospel sermon tells the story of Israel, talks about how Jesus is king, and says, come under the lordship, come under the kingship of Jesus. That's that's the only formula that there is in uh, in that sermon. Jesus is the climax of the story that they've been living. The next one we find in Acts chapter 3. Again, it's Peter preaching it. He and John had just healed a lame man who was standing by, or not standing, he was sitting by the gate of the temple and he was begging. And uh, after they healed him, they brought him into the temple and started to preach to the Jews who were in the temple. Now this sermon is a little bit shorter, but Peter again goes back to Israel's story and reminds them of how God has been with Israel. And then he says in Acts 3.13, he says, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied in the presence of Pilate after he decided to release him. Right? So what is he doing? He's going back to Jesus as the fulfillment of the story of, of the Old Testament. In fact, he tells them that God used their evil for his good. Okay, took what they did and used it to bring about their salvation. Okay, so what's the formula there? Again, uh, here's how 
uh, Jesus is the climax of the Israel story, but you killed him, so what should you do? You should repent and turn back so that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now, one of the things that you'll notice here, and again, I believe in heaven and hell and all of that stuff, but you don't hear him mention any of it there. It, it, you know, it, it just, it's just missing there. It's not there. Not that they didn't believe it, not that I don't believe it, but it's just missing from the gospel presentations, right? This was a, an evangelistic message. Okay, next one. Acts chapter 7. This is one that, that Stephen preaches. And now remember, Stephen was a Hellenistic Jew. He was one of the deacons that was chosen when, uh, when uh, the Hellenistic widows were being overlooked in the distribution of food. Uh, and, uh, and so he grew up somewhere outside of Jerusalem. And, you know, when he was being questioned, he started to preach a gospel message too. And what does he do? You guessed it. He goes back to the story of Israel. Goes back, all the way back to Abraham, in fact, and starts telling that story. And he was longer winded than Peter. I think this is the longest sermon in the Bible. All right? Maybe he was just trying to delay the inevitable. I don't know. But, but he told, like, the whole thing. He went through Abraham to Joseph to Moses to Exodus to King David and Solomon. And he talks about how all through their history that God was present with Israel and he cared for his people. But then he turns the story around and he says, well, God was faithful, but your ancestors were unfaithful. In fact, they killed all the prophets. Of course, the implication is, is they did the same thing with Jesus. But you know what? This generation, you're really no different than your ancestors were before. Well, Stephen's message was so effective that they stoned him to death. Right? So, I don't know, if you want to look at this as an example of how to preach the gospel, I'm not sure that you really want, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Anyway, but, but that, was the, that was the evangelistic sermon. I, yeah, it kind of landed on deaf ears. Okay? But he talked about how the whole story finds its climax in Jesus. Okay? And, and we'll just bump through a couple of others quick. In Acts chapter 8, of course, the Ethiopian uh, eunuch, uh, Philip, uh, found him studying the book of Isaiah. And what did he do? Well, he showed him how Isaiah is actually talking about Jesus, that Jesus is the climax of the Old Testament story. We get to Acts chapter 10, and uh, Peter is talking with Cornelius, who's a Roman centurion, and he ends his sermon this way. He says, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. And then in verse 43, this is what he says, all the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Now, all of the stories are a little bit different. They focused on different aspects of Israel's story, but they all have some common elements, okay? The first is that God was with the people of Israel all along, okay? He was faithful to them. And second, that Jesus is Lord and King. He is the climax of their story. He is what they've been looking for all along, okay? That's the gospel formula in the book of Acts. Now, we come to another uh, gospel sermon in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 13, okay? And this is actually Paul's, this is the passage for today, by the way. This is actually Paul's first evangelistic message, uh, first evangelistic sermon recorded in Acts. And what does he do? Stands up in the synagogue, and he reminds them of their story. Okay? In fact, he had just read from the Law and the Prophets, or they had read from the Law and the Prophets. And, uh, and so then they ask him to come up and start to speak, and he reminds them how, uh, how all throughout their history, God was right there with them. And he gives some examples. He says he was with them in Egypt. He was with them when Moses led them out of Egypt. He was with them when they were wandering in the wilderness. He was with them in the Promised Land. He was with them when they wanted a human king. He was with them even when he acquiesced and gave them King Saul. And he was with them even when Saul failed. He gave them King David and promised that he would establish their throne forever. And then he shows them that Jesus is the climax of that entire story. All right? Now, I know that there are some people who are thinking here. And I know, I've done this poll before. I said, how many, how many Jewish people do we have in here? Uh, and I think we have one person, like one regular member of the congregation who has some like Jewish background. So we're all Gentiles, right? And so the question that we ask is, is why do we care about Israel's story, right? Israel is not us. Or why would the proclamation that Jesus is king, that there's a new king, why would that be good news? Well, here's why. Why? 
Um, you know, as much as we like to, like to think that uh, spending eternity in heaven or spending eternity with, uh, with Christ is good news, and it is, um, a lot of people will wonder, well, why, why would the fact that Jesus is king be better news than that? Well, the truth of the matter is, is if you've spent your entire life living under an oppressive regime of a king or an emperor or a ruler who kept people under their thumb, who, you know, did everything that they could to oppress, then the news that there's a new king would be very welcome news, wouldn't it? And the fact of the matter is, is that all of us live under an oppressive regime, right? We all give ourselves to different kings and different kingdoms that end up oppressing us. This is what we call sin, okay? Whether it's sin that we commit or sin that's committed against us. And so to, to find out that there is a new king who is good and kind and forgiving, that should be great news for all of us, whether we're Jewish or not. And actually, we can talk a little bit more, and, and we will uh, in a few weeks, about how this is good news, not just for Jewish people, but it's also good news for Gentiles. And we actually start to, to see it here. It's good news because Jesus is not just the king of Israel, but he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He is king of the Jews and king of the Gentiles. So this is the gospel presentation. Jesus is the new king. And of course, every presentation needs an invitation, right? A call to respond. And so here's Paul's invitation to the people there. We see it in verse 38. He says, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. All right? Now, this is great. We all want forgiveness of sins. And this is great news for the Jews. But Paul actually continues this invitation with something that we might tend to gloss over if we're not looking at it very carefully. But for many of the Jews there, it started to create some skepticism in their mind about whether this Paul was legit. All right? Because here's how Paul continues. He says uh, in verse 39, Through Jesus, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. A justification that you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. By this one, everyone who believes is justified. Right? Now, it doesn't seem like anyone really brought this up. Right? But here's what was going on in the minds of the Jews who were in the synagogue that day. They were thinking this. Now, hold on, Paul. <laughs> wait, wait a minute here. Right? Are you saying that the law of Moses doesn't get us in? Are you saying that the law of Moses is, is all for naught when it comes to... Se- what do you mean when you say everyone who believes? Do you mean like everyone, everyone? Okay, it's not written here, but we understand from their response that this is what the, the Jewish people were thinking in the synagogue, right? Okay, because let's look at their response. Now, initially, the response seems to be very positive, okay? Remember, these were... Uh, ethnic Jews there. There were also Jewish converts. So in other words, there were Gentiles there who, had, who were God-fearers, who had converted. Uh, and here's what verse 42 says. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. In other words, they wanted to hear more. It was, it was kind of intriguing to them. And, uh, and I don't know why. Maybe they were like, yeah, this seems right. Or maybe it's, this seems wrong. And maybe we need to weed this message out of our synagogue. But they invited him back to speak on the next Sabbath. Okay, but then look what happens. Okay, fast forward to next Sabbath. Verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Almost the whole city. So this congregation, we don't know how many people were normally there, but it wasn't the whole city, right? And uh, now, keep in mind that this is not in Jerusalem. It's not in Galilee. This is not a primarily Jewish city, okay? This is a primarily Gentile city. There would have been probably a significant number of Jews in the city, but in order for the synagogue to be packed the way it was, there had to be a significant number of Gentiles there, Romans, pagans, all of that who had come to listen. And, and so, so what's happening is that the Gentile converts to Judaism went out and they told their friends and family. They said, hey, there's this Jewish rabbi 
that spoke at our synagogue. We'd never seen him before. But he came and he started to talk about some really interesting things. Can you believe that he said that God cares about Gentiles and that they don't have to follow the law in order to be saved? Okay, get this. He said that they can become a part of God's people and they don't even have to go through circumcision. They don't have to eat kosher. Like they can eat seafood, they can eat crab, you know, (laughs) all of that stuff. So, you know, their ears start to perk up a little bit. Yeah, okay, we're, we're going to come and check this out. Let's see what's going on here. And they did. But this is where then the Jews' false kings start to be revealed. Verse 45. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Okay, so they're changing their tune now. Now, why is it? Well, because of jealousy. All right, let's, let's explore this a little bit. This is actually one of the dangers of religion. Okay, it doesn't have to be. But because of human nature, it, it tends to be. That it, it's really human nature to divide the world into us and them. Okay, not just us and them, but actually us versus them. And there's nothing inherently wrong with seeing groups of us and them. We look at men and women, my family, your family, Americans and Sierra Leoneans and Egyptians. You know, there's something, you know, we group ourselves together by cultures and things like that. And uh, even the distinction between Jews and Gentiles, everyone recognizes that we sometimes make distinctions between groups, okay? It's just part of human nature. Now, when it becomes a problem, is when we start to see our group as inherently better than their group. Suddenly we become the righteous ones and they're the wicked. And we start to become blind and we only see our own virtue, but we lose sight of our own vices and then we do the opposite for the, for the out group. Okay? And you might think that religion should soften this, but actually when you think about religion in general, and if you look at the history of religion, it actually oftentimes amplifies it and turns squabbles into wars. In fact, sociologists can tell us, uh, they tell us that we can actually form stronger social bonds when we find a group of people that we are against and we set ourselves up against that group. And we can start to feel self-righteous that way, that we are the righteous and they are the wicked, we are right and they are wrong. And when it gets to that point, then we want to set some very clear boundaries. We don't want to blur the lines. Okay, and so we have different behaviors and we have different rites of passage and things like that. And again, they're not inherently wrong, but this is oftentimes how we set those hard boundaries between us and them and how us and them becomes us versus them. And as we've seen throughout the book of Luke and now in the book of Acts, that this is not to be the way of the church. Yes, there are Christians and there are not Christians. And there are boundaries there. There are things that make someone a Christian, things that make someone not a Christian. But Jesus never allows us to define ourselves in opposition to other groups. But that's what we start to see happening here with the Jews at the synagogue. Okay, here's how Houston Gonzalez puts it. He says, These particular Jews in Antioch apparently considered themselves the exclusive owners of that revelation. It's all right for a few God-fearers to come to the synagogue. It's all right for some of them to be converted, to submit to circumcision, and to become proselytes. What is not all right is for the doors to be opened so wide that the Gentiles will flood in and the Jews will lose their ancient position of privilege. In other words, if all the Gentiles start showing up, we're going to lose power, we're going to lose control, and the synagogue will become unmanageable. I always find it really easy to criticize the ignorant people in the Bible back then. Man, what were they doing? Man, if I were one of those Jews, I would have welcomed those Gentiles in, right? Probably not. Most likely not. In September, we're going to start a Celebrate Recovery group here at the church, Allison Bowie is going to be leading it. I'm really excited about it. I'm excited about Celebrate Recovery. I'm excited that Allison is leading it. She has a great deal of knowledge and is excited about it herself. And, uh, it, you know, it's one of those, I'm excited about it because it's one of those ministries that doesn't gloss over the problems that we have in life. 
whether it's drug or alcohol addiction or any of the sort of normal things, grief or anger or the every other uh, everyday issues that we struggle with in life. Okay, I think it's a great program. Uh, I'm hopeful for it. We're praying for it. I hope you guys are praying for it as well. I know of another church who started to celebrate recovery ministry. And uh, they had a group of dedicated leaders. In fact, one in particular who was uh, a former drug addict that was radically saved and, uh, man, gave his life to Jesus and just was radically changed. He was just a different guy. And he just had a way of, of gathering people around him who were like that. And in that church, the ministry took off, and they would have around 75 people at their midweek Celebrate Recovery ministry in a church of probably 250 people. Okay, So this was a, this was a significant number of people. They would have anywhere from 50 to 100 people get saved every year. Uh, not only that, but they didn't just go to Celebrate recovery but they started to actually come to church on Sunday morning now the church was primarily a white middle-class church lots of people who grew up in the church lots of families and so when the celebrate recovery people started coming to worship service and didn't necessarily always have control of their kids or they would step outside to smoke between Sunday school and worship service the church started to change a bit. Okay, there are far more people coming to Jesus when, than there had before, but also a lot more cigarette butts and tattoos and distractions in worship service. Now you might think that the church would see this as a good trade-off. We'll take a few cigarette butts in the parking lot for 50 people being saved this year. But that's actually not what happened. Uh, there were a few people who embraced the new, but many did not. In fact, families started to leave the church because of those people. And they would start to make you know, excuses like, well, it no longer meets our needs. This is not the church that I signed up for. And again, it's easy to criticize people when we think we would never do that. But it actually happens all the time, much more often than you might think. Not just with recovery br- groups, but oftentimes when a church diversifies ethnically, it happens, okay? Tries to be intentional about bringing minorities into leadership to actually shape the, the future of the church, and then all of a sudden, people from the dominant culture start to leave. Sociologists will tell you this is what happens in churches. Or when an older church begins to skew younger, the older people, they don't always leave, but oftentimes they will complain or, you know, this is not the kind of church that I had. Now, I want to stop for a minute here, and I want to affirm you guys in this. Is that this is generational shift? Is some those of you who have been around a while? This generational shift is something that's happened in this church over the last ten or fifteen years, and um, I have never seen this attitude with you. I, in fact, I'm I'm trying to think of a one person who who ever had this attitude. Now, I know we've made a lot of changes. You guys, you know, you who have been around a while, you know that we've made a lot of changes, okay? Uh, those of you who haven't been around so long, you don't know. Uh, and for many of you, what we do right now, you don't like it as much as what we used to do. But I will just tell you, you guys have been so gracious. You've had such a vision uh, for the fact that, that God is inviting all people into his kingdom, People of all different kinds. And, and that means that oftentimes we have to give up our preferences, preferences and you guys have seen like the results of it. And you've been so open to it. And so I just want to make sure that even as, as I'm you know, blasting churches for, for not doing this, I want to make sure that I affirm you guys. It's, just, it's been amazing. It's, been, uh, it's made it so much uh, easier, so much of a joy to, uh, to be able to pastor this church. And I know still it's not, you know, exactly what all of you would want. But you've stuck around and you see the new people and you see the, the life that, that's here in the church. And, uh, and that's what shows you that, that when we're open to the new, when we're open to the next generation of leadership, some great things can happen. Okay, you guys have proved that it can be done. And I think it's because you believe that the gospel is not just for people like us and it's not just for our own personal salvation or for our comfort, but it's that Jesus is the Lord and King and he wants everyone to be a part of his kingdom.
Okay? And that's why in just a couple of chapters, the apostles, they're trying to deal with this influx of Gentiles who are coming in. This is uh, Acts chapter 15. And, and a lot of the Jews are complaining about these Gentiles coming into the church. And so they go to the apostles and they decide that, that, that it's consistent with the gospel. And this is what they say, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Okay? Now, this is where people start to get a little bit uneasy. Because they think, well, you've got to be careful here because we're going to start to normalize immorality. Okay? But that's not what I'm talking about. Okay? And, and actually, that's not what the apostles did either. In fact, when they said, we should not make it hard for the, the Gentiles who are coming to God, in, in verse 20, this is Acts 15, 20, they say, instead, we should write to them telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and of the meat strang- strangled, fr- of strangled animals, and from blood. Okay, so there were some rules, there were some ways like this is how we operate as a church, but at the same time, we don't reject people because they're different from us. Okay, so it wasn't anything goes, but we need to understand that the gospel is far more expansive than we're often comfortable with. Now, the response of the Jews didn't actually deter Paul from his radical message. Look at what Paul and Barnabas said to the Jews in verse 46. He says to them, we had to speak the word of God to you first, but since you rejected it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That's a quote from Isaiah 49, 6. And then look at the result here. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. Fruit. That's fruit. Okay. Starting to run out of time, so what what, uh, applications can we make from this? Very simple. Here's the first one. First of all, Jesus doesn't just call us to accept him as Savior, but as Lord and King. He calls us to accept him as Lord and King. Now we get him as savior, that's part, that's part of the package, right? But the first thing we do is we have to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and I hope that you see the difference, okay? If Jesus is the savior that just gets me into heaven, then he can largely be irrelevant to the rest of my life, okay? I can just pray the prayer and just wait until Jesus returns or I die and you know, then I've got eternity in heaven. But if Jesus is my Lord and King, then I give him control over every area of my life. If Jesus is my King, then I have to reject the false kingdoms and the false gospels that come my way, the gospel of money or achievement or family or sex or romance or nationalism or freedom. All of these false gospels claim to be the fulfillment of my story, that if I follow them, then I will find what I've always been looking for. But they will always leave us empty. But it's only when we come under the kingship of Jesus that we find the eternal king, that we find what we have always been looking for. And it's more than just accepting Jesus as my savior. It's making him the Lord of my life. And when I do that, I can experience abundant life now and eternal life later. Okay? That's the appropriate response to the message that Jesus is king. And some of you may need to do that for the very first time, and some of you may to, maybe need to re-up. Maybe you need to, to look at how you've been living and saying, you know what, I've been buying into these false gospels, and I need to recommit to Jesus as my king. And if that's the case, I'd love for you to do that today. Here's the second application. Is that we have to remember that God's love, that the love of the king is expansive. Okay, he wants everyone to be a part of the kingdom and, he, and to bring us all into the family. And, and while there are still some people that we have a hard time believing that God loves and wants to bring into the family, or maybe we would be happy if God would save them but then keep them over there for a while, you know, until they get their stuff together. Um, you know, sometimes we have that attitude as well. But part of living in the kingdom is learning to develop a heart for those people that we wonder if they can be saved. And even if they can be saved, we wonder if we really want them to be saved. 
The love of the king is expansive. In fact, in a few weeks, we're going to take a, bo- take a break from the book of Acts. And uh, we're going to do our fall focus season. That's where we align everything, sermons, small groups, all of that with the messages. And this one is going to be on evangelism. We're going to talk about how do we share the gospel in today's postmodern or modern society. But here's one thing that I know. Is that until we understand, until we, until we internalize the expansive love of God, all the training in the world won't do any good. Because we won't have a motivation. We'll say, well, what's the point of all of this? And so one of the things that I want you to pray over the next few weeks is, God, would you just open my heart to people who are different from me? Would you open my heart to people who are far from you? Would you open my heart to people who are living under false gospels and false kingdoms and they're starting to feel the weight of that? Would you open my heart to those people so that I can have not just training, but also the motivation to share this gospel that is such great news for everyone. Lord, we thank you that you are the climax of our story. We thank you that you have given us everything that we need and you have shown us through the death and resurrection of Jesus that you are the one and eternal king. And God, I pray for this congregation and I pray for Christians everywhere. God, may we be reminded regularly that you are the King of Kings, that you are the Lord of Lords, and that we would give ourselves to you and to your kingdom and the way of the kingdom. And as we do that, Lord, would you help us to see people the way you see them, to not be protective of of what we have, to be willing to be open-handed with our preferences, to be open-handed with our time and our energy so that we can see people, receive the good news, to accept it, to embody it, to make it a part of their own lives. We thank you for your great love for us that forgives our sins, that makes abundant life now and eternal life later possible. And God, I pray that each of us would, would live our lives in light of that truth. We pray this in Jesus' name.